Today we're looking at the artistic periods in Europe, from the Classical era through the Renaissance. If we look at the Classical period, which basically runs from about 500 BCE to about 500 CE, what we find are that the common forms of art included sculpture, painted pottery, murals, or more commonly frescoes, and mosaics. Now the purposes of art were to show the importance of people, and especially political leaders, and to highlight the importance of the gods. Because remember, the classical period, 500 BCE to 500 CE, this coincides with the heyday of the later Greek city-states, of the Roman Republic, and the Roman Empire, so basically the tail end of true paganism in Europe. Let's look at an example of classical art a little more closely. We're going to look at that sculpture that you see there on the bottom right. This particular sculpture, done in marble, is called Discobolus, or Disc Thrower. This is a Roman copy of a Greek original. The original was done in 450 BCE in bronze. Now, one thing to notice about classical sculpture is that the bodies portrayed were often portrayed in the nude. That doesn't mean that the sculpture stayed nude. In fact, very often, Greeks and Romans clothed their sculptures. But the sculptures themselves were often done nude. In looking at these nude forms, something else that we notice is that these are idealized forms. If you look at this athlete, he is very obviously an athlete. The muscles in his arm and his chest are very well developed, and you can see the muscles tensing in his legs as well. This is, again, an idealized version of what a male body should look like. Now, often in classical art, there is very little sense of a background or even a sense of perspective. Now, in sculpture, of course, we'd expect this because our focus is on the image of the sculpture. But this is true, really, even in much of classical painting or frescoes. You get a sense of what's happening in the foreground, in the front of the image, but not so much in the background. And again, this is a generalization. It varies. But generally speaking, little sense of a background or a sense of perspective. So, as an observer of this art, our eyes are drawn to the figures, the bodies. And what we see is that the bodies look active. They move convincingly. In fact, you can kind of imagine that when Discobolus is getting ready to throw the disc, he just kind of unwinds from the position that he's in, and you can imagine him letting go of the disc and seeing it fly. So, we, as observers, are convinced that the position his body is in is, in fact, accurate to the task at hand. Now, all of that said, if we look at his face, it's awfully bland. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm engaged in some sort of physical exertion, you see it on my face. And it's not just because my skin is pale and it turns all red and I get sweaty, but very often when we're engaged in something that requires our concentration, we screw up our faces or we bite down on our lips or maybe bite down on our tongues, our eyes squint. There's some sense of effort on our faces and you don't see that in classical art. In fact, the faces tend to be bland and calm. We might even say that they don't really show emotion. And so there's a little bit of a disconnect between the task that we see their body doing and the way that that is mirrored on their faces. As we move towards looking at art in the medieval period, and this is basically art from the fall of the Western Roman Empire, about 500 CE, all the way to the start of the Renaissance, about 1400 CE, what we find are that common forms of art have changed just a little bit in terms of what we see produced. For example, now in the medieval period, we see stained glass as a high form of art. Sculptures, of course, are still around, but now illuminated manuscripts are as well, as artists, most likely monks, are working to illustrate the biblical and theological texts that they are copying. We also see tapestries, and tapestries were used on the walls of castles, less so in churches or cathedrals, and they had a purpose. Not only could they showcase what had happened, history, etc., but they also were providing warmth. Um, you put them up against the walls and they guarded against drafts, etc. By and large, art of the medieval period had a very different purpose from classical art. Its purpose was to teach religion to a largely illiterate populace and to glorify God. So, as you might imagine, we tend to see really religious imagery in the medieval period. And we're going to look at an example of that a little more closely, looking at that relief sculpture that you see there at the bottom right. The image you see here is the narthex tympanum, 
or the decoration on top of the doors of Vézelay Cathedral in France. As you can see, it was created in the 12th century. Now, as I'd mentioned before, the subject is mostly religious. Now, for those of you who don't have a whole lot of background in Christian religious art, you might not notice that right away, but bear with me. We'll look at exactly how this is religious. In medieval art, scale matters, and the larger an image is, the more important it is to the piece of art. In other words, the art is hieratic. Important figures are shown largely. What you see here in the center of this particular image is an enormously huge seated Jesus. Now, you can probably also notice that he's not really in proportion. Proportion wasn't something that medieval artists were really interested in. What they wanted to show you was that Jesus was the most important figure in this art piece, and he's right smack dab in the middle. Now, again, something that's a little bit hard to see on a piece of relief sculpture, but is true nonetheless of medieval art, is that backgrounds were often shown just a single color very often just gold, because usually with religious art, what they wanted to showcase was that this was something happening in heaven. Conversely, this might be just a really dark background, and it was something happening just in hell. So there wasn't a whole lot of emphasis on what was going on in the background. The emphasis was all on the foreground. What does the image show us? So let's look again at the figures here. And one thing we notice is that they're flat and stiff. In counterpoint to what we see with classical art where the figures all look very much like a body would look if it was engaging in any of those tasks, what we see with medieval art are figures that seem awkwardly positioned. Um, even when we look at the most important figures, there's something just off about them. So let's come back and look at our main figure here of Jesus. So he's sitting on his throne, and he's sitting kind of awkwardly, so we see all of him kind of sideways on his throne. If we were to stretch him out, stand him up, you'd notice that he's not in proportion. His legs are enormously long. Look at how big his hands are, um, and how tiny his little face is, right? So even though we recognize that this is a human figure, and we recognize that this is supposed to be Jesus, we also recognize that this isn't really a good perspective image of Jesus. Now, if we were to look also at some of these other figures and what they look like, um, what we inevitably notice is that they're also posed kind of awkwardly. Look at the apostles who are sitting here to each side of Jesus. They too are sitting in weird positions, their legs kind of stretching out in odd ways, uh, probably not the most comfortable positions to be in. If we look at the image as a whole, so kind of step back a little bit, we notice that there are three different borders. The number three is a really important symbolism in the Christian tradition. So we have a border here, which is kind of floral and decorative, and then we have a second border right here. And if you look at that really closely, it's a combination of more ancient symbols, including even zodiac signs, which you can see, there's Scorpio right there. And then with the third border, the one right here, what you see are people doing good deeds, uh, people who are going to heaven because of their good deeds. So kind of a logical framework, people doing things on earth, the heavens represented here, and then this more decorative kind of starry framework on the outside. On the bottom here, of the tympanum, what you see are the damned, people who are going to hell because they didn't do what they were supposed to be doing uh, in terms of their religion. So think about what this must have been like. This is the tympanum to the narthex, so this is the entrance to the sanctuary. So you're walking in and as you look up over that, yes, you see Jesus enthroned and this is a wonderful thing, but you also see a warning. You know, what happens to you if you don't do what you're supposed to be doing? and what you learn about within those church doors. Finally, we hit the Renaissance period, which begins about 1400 CE, a little bit earlier in Italy, and it lasts until about 1650 CE. And in the Renaissance period, what we have is an increasing influence of humanism, which included an interest in the classical era, and in particular, classical writing and classical artwork. As the humanists of Europe in the Renaissance rediscovered classical writings and artwork, they borrowed ancient techniques and they created new techniques. So sometimes this meant that they read through treatises and realized again how to do wonderful realistic art. In other cases, it means that they really always knew how to do the art, but now they wanted to mimic that classical art again 
instead of creating art whose emphasis was on a religious story and not so much on realism. So if we look at typical forms of art in the Renaissance period, what we see is that these forms harken back to the classical era. Stained glass was still produced, but it wasn't as important in the Renaissance as it had been in the medieval era. So you have sculptures, again, you have murals from frescoes, you have drawings, you have paintings. And the purpose here is not exclusively about religion, although religious subjects played an enormously large role in Renaissance art, but rather the purpose of the art is to highlight the importance of the individual and nature. So very often, even when artists chose a religious subject, they chose it because they wanted to highlight the individuals in that story, the Virgin Mary, the baby Jesus, and not so much just to show a religious story of the nativity. The first movement, art movement, of the Renaissance period is called Renaissance Realism. Sometimes it's referred to as idealism. And if we look at the trajectory, how did Renaissance Realism come to pass, really we get stuck with the work of Giotto. Giotto is one of these artists who, like Dante, whom you're reading, has a foot stuck in two worlds. He's living really in the Middle Ages, but he's looking forward to the Renaissance, at least in an artistic sense. The image that you see here is one of his better known frescoes, and it depicts the death of Jesus. And if we were to look at this more closely and compare it to what we see in medieval art, and first of all, we have figures that maybe seem still a little stiff, but they're certainly moving a little more naturally than they were in the medieval art. Um, and in fact, if you look at their faces closely, their faces are very expressive, and each of them have a different expression on their face. If we look here at a dead Jesus, well, you can see from the color of his skin that he's clearly not alive. And then if you look at his mother, it's hard to see, but she's crying. There are tears on her face as she cradles her adult son. You look at some of the apostles, and here you have John who's got his arms outstretched as though he's sobbing, crying out into the world, you know, why did this happen? And some of the women who were present at the crucifixion of Jesus, according to the biblical stories, are also kind of wringing their hands and crying as they look at this figure of Jesus. You have angels and cherubs up in heaven who are looking down and are also crying and wringing their hands. So the heavens are mimicking the emotions of the humans on earth. But look at what else we see in this image. What else we see is that you've got background. You've got something that wasn't really done in the Middle Ages. We have an outcropping of rock, and in fact, multiple ones, so we get a sense kind of of a hilly or a mountainous range. You have nature, you have trees depicted, you have a, a landscape, a horizon at the very end. And it's, it's dark, this is in conjunction with the biblical story, um, but you get to see what's happening in the foreground, in the front of the image, pretty closely. A Giotto's work is going to look ahead to the more formal and realistic art of the true Renaissance. The Renaissance can be said to begin in Florence, as we've already discussed, and it really begins with the patronage of the Medici family, who sought out and ensured that young artists, young architects, etc., were able to practice their craft in a way that glorified the city of Florence, but also, of course, the Medici family. Cosimo de' Medici, in particular, patronized many young artists, including one artist and architect who would lay the foundation for later Renaissance art. This artist was Brunelleschi. Now, Brunelleschi was obsessed with classical art, and he was determined to create art as realistic as the classical artists had been able to do. He was an architect by trade, and he worked to improve his own sketches to make them as realistic as possible. In his quest to create the most realistic sketches, he developed a precise and mathematical way to create the illusion of three dimensions on paper or on canvas. His work on perspective inspired other artists to use the same method. And what Brunelleschi realized is that when he looks out at a horizon, all of the lines in your eyesight vanish to a point, right? What we call a vanishing point in art, which you kind of see right here. And he realized that if he drew lines from that point out into a sort of grid system and then focused on reproducing what he could see in each of these grids, 
he could create a very lifelike and perspective image of whatever it was he was looking at. He further recognized that there are also vanishing points on the edges of his eyesight, right? So if you're looking at the horizon, not only is there a vanishing point in front of you, but basically on the edges, on your peripheral vision, you also have a vanishing sight. So he's able to draw these grids, which help him to very realistically portray the landscapes that he's trying to imitate. Now, what Brunelleschi is best remembered for, however, is for completing the Duomo of the Duomo, the Florentine Cathedral. He had spent years studying Roman domes, and he developed a theory for how the dome might be constructed without the use of expensive wooden scaffolding. With the support of the Medici family, Brunelleschi won the commission, and he began construction on the dome in 1419. It would be finished in 1434. The dome is an engineering marvel, primarily because of the ingenious use of two different ways of laying brick, which you can see in the image right here. What he realized was that his dome could not be a true half-sphere. It actually had to mimic more the end of an egg. And in doing so, this distributed the weight of his dome a little more easily, and he, it allowed him to create the largest dome that had been built since the time of the Roman Empire. Now, all of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Leonardo da Vinci, who was unique in the sense that he dabbled in a wide variety of interests, which included not just the visual arts, but also anatomy and even mathematics. His drawing, known as Vitruvian Man, combines these interests. And what Leonardo was interested in doing was figuring out how the body works, and in doing so, then being able to represent the body accurately. So when he looks at Vitruvian Man, you can see a variety of positions, and then he's also playing with mathematical themes, right? Looking at how the square and the circle, um, a general triangle of the way that man is standing. If we look at probably his best known work, which is La Gioconda, or the Mona Lisa, we notice that this is a work which highlights that human individualistic focus of the Renaissance. The technique that he used to create this work requires the addition of transparent layer upon transparent layer of paint. And this is what creates the shadows that we see. So he's not playing with just black paint in the shadows right here. This is actually layer upon layer upon layer of green to give the sense that you've got these very, very rich green velvet robes which are covering La Giaconda. You can also see, however, that he's made a bit of a mistake in the landscape, right? Look at where the horizon is up here, and then look at kind of how it's just a little bit off on the other side. There's a sort of fanciful background. You see a bridge right here, certainly water, sense of woods, etc. So the depth is certainly there. We know that we're looking at her and then out a window behind her and further into the distance. She's very much in the foreground. That is very much in the background. Um, but he makes a, a few mistakes here in terms of perspective and proportion. And one of the reasons that Giaconda is so, so famous is because it's said that no matter how you look at her, her eyes seem to follow you. It's a little bit hard to see in a recorded lecture like this, but I challenge you to pause the screen and just kind of walk around, around your computer, and I'll bet those eyes seem to follow you no matter where you are. Cosimo de' Medici's son, Lorenzo the Magnificent de' Medici, was even more of an art patron than his father had been. Under his patronage, Florence would see the rise of the best known of the Renaissance painters and sculptors. Michelangelo was about 13 years old when Lorenzo first noticed his talent. He thought that Michelangelo was so talented that he invited Michelangelo to live with the Medici family at the Medici Palace. So Michelangelo grew up alongside Lorenzo's own children, including his son Giovanni, who would later become Pope Leo X in charge of all of Western Christendom. What you see here in this image is probably Michelangelo's best known sculpture, which is, of course, the David. Now, this sculpture is immense, and you don't really get a sense of that from the photograph. Its base, which you don't really see in the image, but it's kind of down at the bottom, itself is six feet in height. The statue is 17 feet in height. So David stands quite tall above the rest of the audience coming in, right? So keep in mind that as you're approaching the statue, 
most of us aren't even as tall as the pedestal on which he stands. If we study David more closely, we see that there are a lot of elements of classical art here as well. This is a nude form, and it's an idealized form in the way that classical sculpture was idealized. Keeping in mind that in the biblical story, David's a teenager when he defeats Goliath, and this is what we see happening here. This is at kind of the point of victory. So his arm is bent, this arm right here, and what he's holding and what is shown on the back of the sculpture is the slingshot that David used to kill Goliath. Um, I don't know about you, though, this physique isn't really what I think of as a 16-year-old physique, right? So David is shown in this idealized form, um, kind of halfway between the teenager he's supposed to be and the man, the great man and king that David will become. David is standing in a very distinct pose, what is known as contraposto, with his weight all on one foot, his hip jutting out to maintain his center of gravity, and his shoulders aiming in the opposite direction. Um, so this is a body that forms what is called a lazy S shape. Again, that's contraposto. Now, what that means is that Michelangelo and other Renaissance sculptors are studying the human body so closely that they know that anybody who stands with all of their weight on one foot, naturally shifts their body in this way. If you're watching this lecture at home, stand up and do that. Put all of your weight on one foot and really be conscious of how your hip sticks out, the other leg bends a little bit to accommodate that hip jut, and how your shoulders shift just a little bit to help you maintain that standing pose, that center of gravity. Now, interestingly, if you're looking at the David view directly like this, he looks not quite in proportion. And this is in fact true. Michelangelo realized that he was creating this huge and enormously tall statue and that most of us weren't going to be anywhere near as tall as the David. So since we were going to be standing at the bottom looking up, he realized that in order to make the entire statue look proportional, the, the items that were further away from the audience had to be done bigger. So David's head is enormous in comparison to the rest of his body. His arms are quite long. His hands are pretty big as well. All of this to demonstrate, if we're standing down at the bottom looking up at this seven-foot tall statue, taller than that if we're looking at this six-foot pedestal as well, we've got to make sure that all of that is now in proportion. So Michelangelo was using geometry. He was using engineering to ensure that his piece of art show the correct proportions, even though you were looking at it from a distorted view. So there you have it, a very quick look at how art changed between the classical, medieval, and Renaissance eras.